Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this session on measuring capital. In this session, we will have two presentations. Each presenter will have 20 minutes to present and 10 minutes for Q&A at the end of each talk. If you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen to submit your question. If you're invited to ask a question, we'll enable you to unmute your microphone. Please introduce yourself by stating your name and affiliation. Please note this session will be recorded. And our first presenter will be Professor Mary O'Mahony from King's College London. Uh, Mary, I'll give you a reminder when there are five minutes left. So without further ado, Mary, the virtual floor is yours. Hello. Hi. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'll just um, share my screen. Put the slides up. Okay. Um, let me go back up to the. I want to go back up. Okay. Sorry, I had a <laughs> slight glitch there. Right. Okay. So this is a joint work with Martin Wheel, also at King's College London. And uh, what we're looking at here is the idea of um, separating out um, net capital services and depreciation when looking at the impact of capital input on uh, growth accounting. And in particular, what we're looking at here is the um, how much do intangibles contribute to economic growth when you look at a, a net rather than a, a gross accounting framework. So we have, um, we do, I, I'll start with a, a couple of um, slides based on previous work. Uh, then I want to talk a little bit about um, the data and um, the, the um, depreciation rates we're looking at here. And then we go and talk about um, growth accounting with depreciation for components of growth capital uh, formation, which you know, we, we separate out um, tangible and intangible and uh, net and depreciation in both cases. And then what, we are, what I'm going to present is some very preliminary numbers um, as an illustration for the UK and the US. Um, for the total aggregate market economy in both cases. Um, so we look at first um, shares and remuneration, and then we look at uh, contributions to economic growth from depreciation and net capital services. So um, I guess it, to many of the audience, these kind of numbers are, are familiar. So if we look at, we just picked out a few slides from um, the previous literature, but if you look at it, for example, in, in the UK, um, the, um, and, and compare tangibles and intangibles um, uh, investments, you'll see that intangibles have grown quite considerably more than uh, tangibles uh, in the period from the early 1990s to, in this case, it was 2010, and that has continued on uh, to the current period. So this is from Goodrich, Haskell and Wallace. A similar kind of picture emerges for the US. So if you look here, this is percent of the non-farm business sector, which is approximately similar to, it, it's not quite the same as the market sector we're going to use in this, Paper, but um, but you see that um, tangible investments have been have been uh, kind of steady or else declining in, in uh, towards the early two thousands. But you get this big increase in intangible capital. And then, if you do a growth accounting kind of decomposition, and we've taken this from one of the uh, the Carrad and Halton paper, um, you see that um, over time the contribution of intangible capital to total output growth has, has, has increased quite dramatically, particularly in the period since, since the uh, mid 1990s. So um, what we, you know, the, the take from this literature is that intangible is a very important part of um, investment behavior by firms, and they have important contributions to uh, explaining output, output per uh, hour worked or even output shares in, in, uh, in the economy. So what we are, asking here, and I think it goes to, it, we're looking at this specifically in the case of intangibles, but there's a kind of a more general question here about um, how helpful is GDP um, as a measure of, um, when, when you're looking at a measure of growth in the economy, because um, some forms of capital decrease very, very rapidly. And um, these, these um, increase in investment in these types of assets can have a very powerful effect on GDP, but they may be much more limited effect on net national product. And, and this is one of the reasons for focusing on intangibles is intangibles have a very high depreciation rate. So we think it's, it's, it's desirable to distinguish contributions to depreciation from contributions to net uh, domestic product. 
Um, and a footnote that Martin put in, and he knows more about this history of um, national accounting than I do, but um, in, in, he, su he suggests that um, the first UK national accounts published in the, in the early 1940s focused on this measure of net income and net cap uh, capital formation rather than the gross figures. And at some stage, um, national accounts moved to, to the gross figures, but there is a question of, of, of why and what, what kind of different picture you get if you, if you, if you focus on net on net income rather than uh, gross income. Um, and this distinction is, is particularly important when trying to understand changes to economic well-being. And, and um, Paul Schreier emphasized this this morning in his, his keynote speech. So um, in, in terms of how much growth contributes to people's um, sense of well-being, investing in, in um, the kinds of assets that um, you know, have very high depreciation rates and you have to keep investing more to just to stay still has, has a, a less of an impact on economic well-being than um so so there's there's there is an important distinction here too um that if, if we really are focused on economic well-being then maybe a net measure that takes out these rapid depreciation uh in in, in some assets um is, is a better measure okay so i'd like to talk a little bit about the data um so we're, we're, we're using these for illustration purposes. And I, I have to say, I have a, a big caveat on, on these data sources um, at this stage. So um, I think they, they, they need to be seen as illustrating the, the arguments rather than as uh, absolute figures. Um, we take the data on tangible uh, gross capital formation um, from EU CLEMS and then the intangible assets from uh, the Intan Invest data set. And one of the problems here is that these two data sets are not compatible with each other. Now, they, um, there is a, an initiative that's been financed by the European Commission uh, ongoing at the moment and, and with first results due soon, where um, the, the, the two sets of figures are, are going to be made to be compatible. And then in that case, we'll redo our calculations and um, we'll get something that um, probably, you know, in terms of we'll, the numbers will make more sense. Um, so, um, so please, a, a caveat here, don't take these numbers as gospel. Um, there are some, some data issues here. Um, the estimates of, of the capital stock are calculating using, using the usual perpetual inventory method and depreciation rates, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. The starting values for the tangible capital stocks are based on gross uh, capital formation data, uh, where we were able to backdate these to 1970 using the old EU CLEMS. Now, again, there are some consistency issues with old and new versions of EU CLEMS. Um, but, um, but generally, I think these, these um, the starting values for tangible capital stocks, uh, because we go back a long way, they have very little um, impact on the, the kind of period we're looking at, um, which is from the mid 1990s. Um, when we come to the stocks of intangibles, um, they only start in 1995, the uh, intern invest data period, and we, uh, I, I I'd like to note at this stage that these, um, our, our estimates do depend quite a lot on the assumptions you make about the starting capital stock. Um, we, we're using the, the a, a, a formula that's that's used in, in, in much of this work by um, uh, uh, taking the um, starting period investment and dividing by the, the relevant depreciation rate. Then um, I'd like to um, just to have a, a slide just showing what these depreciation rates look like and why we're interested in this kind of um, distinction between intangibles and tangible capital. So you'll see on, on, on the left-hand side are the um, intent and best depreciation rates that are used in the intent and best database, and on the right are EU CLEMS. And um, for many of the um, intangible capital um, items here, the depreciation rates are very large. And in particular, in the organizational capital training and brands part of the economic competencies part of that data set, uh, the depreciation rates are really, really quite rapid. Um, where these depreciation rates come from, there's a, there's a good discussion in the Intern Invest papers by Jonathan Haskell and co-authors on, you know, justifying these and, and you know, that's good arguments for what these, uh, for these numbers. If we look at the um, tangible capital, the depreciation rates are, are lower, uh, significantly lower in some cases, particularly for um, other machinery and non-residential structures, which make up really the bulk of this, this, this tangible capital. If you were to ask where do these depreciation rates come from and how reliable they are, well, um, as I was, you know, working through the slides, I did ask myself that question, and I think um, 
they, they're based on some work I did at the start of EU CLIMS based on US depreciation rates nearly 20 years ago. And I think um, maybe we need to, to, to relook at some of these again and um, see if they, if they, how reliable they are. But they, they are based on um, currently what's used in the EU CLEMS database. And um, again, it's kind of illustrative rather than being um, uh, you know, def definitive numbers that we're presenting here. So what we're trying to do then is um, we're looking at uh, four components of capital formation, intangible net capital, intangible depreciation, tangible net capital, and tangible depreciation. So we develop a framework to distinguish the depreciation services from the net capital services provided by each type of capital. Um, and then we aggregate to give, to give the four categories that we, we, we mention here. And we do this in, in a very standard way. So um, just a, a couple of slides on the method. Um, we assume that the volumes uh, of each type of capital are proportional to the capital stocks is the usual assumptions that made, that made. And then we use a, we, we use a um, calculate a remuneration of capital by using a user cost of capital um, formula as given, given here. And the, the price of net capital services is this um, user cost minus the depreciation rate and the price of the depreciation services then are the, um, the depreciation term there. And then we multiply those by the uh, quantities of, of, of capital stocks in, in, in all four cases to get our remunerations. Um, and then we can define divisio indexes of the growth in um, gross capital stock, um, or gross capital services, um, net capital services and depreciation services. And um, there is a technical note if anyone's interested, um, we, can, we, can, we can send it to you. Um, uh, on this underlying framework, but you can show that the um, uh, the uh, gross uh, capital services, the the, the the growth in the gross capital services are a weighted average of the net and the depreciation with the weights given by um, uh, in, in the formula here. And then um, what we do for um, the growth accounting contribution is um, the standard growth accounting uh, relationship is given by the first equation. And then we de decompose that into um, the uh, net capital services term, uh, depreciation term, labor term and residual are the same. And uh, yes, so um, in the interest of time, um, I'll just uh, go on to just talking about some of the, the figures here. So first of all, to look at the UK, um, we, so what we've got here is um, the blue is um, intangible depreciation, the orange is Intangible, intangible net capital and, and the shares of uh, intangibles in, in uh, of, of, of gross intangibles then is the sum of those two. So as you can see from this figure, the depreciation part of, of the remuneration is very large relative to the, um, the in, intangible net capital. Now, this is also true for tangible, but less so. So the depreciation term is, is also quite large, but it's smaller than the tangible uh, net capital remuneration. If you look at um, the contribution of, uh, or, or the share of intangibles uh, to gross um, remuneration, total remuneration of capital, um, that's about 40% in the UK. If you look at the share in the net remuneration, getting rid of the of basically of the of the uh, depreciation terms, it, it it falls to about twenty five percent. So intangibles become less important in the remuneration to capital if you look use a net rather than a gross approach, and you get a similar result for the US, but the differences are not as large as they are for the UK. So um, uh, on average, um, the uh, remuneration. Uh, of intangibles is about 43% in the, in the US in gross terms, and uh, it falls to about 30% in, in, in net terms. So there is that, that distinction, and we haven't really looked into why that is yet, um, but there's probably some interesting compositional differences here that, 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 that can explain this. Then we do this growth uh, contributions to growth in GDP, and uh, you see that um, what you want to compare here is the the, the, the sum of the blue and the, and the orange bars, that's the total intangibles relative to the, um, uh, the yellow and gray. And, and look at that relative to, if you just compare the orange bars and, and, and the yellow bars, and you'll see that the, um, it, it, it's um, quite clear at all time periods that um, the, the um, 
the contribution, the relative importance of the intangibles is much lower if, if, you, if you just concentrate on the orange versus the yellow than if you look at, at, at the whole picture. And we get a similar um, uh, picture for the US. And I think um, what's uh, useful here is just to look at, at the summary table looking at different time periods. So um, if you look at um, intangible depreciation and intangible net capital formation, um, they um, account uh, in, on, in gross terms, they account for a higher um, uh, uh, contribution to output growth in the US than the UK, and maybe less so in the later period than, than earlier. Um, and then um, that also holds true if you look at the, the net, the contributions of net uh, capital formation to um, uh, output growth. So if you strip out the depreciation, but you can see that there's um, quite a big uh, contribution for depreciation um, in, 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 in the growth to, to, to output growth. And if you were doing a net accounting, you would um, strip that out. And then the, 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 the relative importance of, of tangible uh, to intangible changes. So the intangibles become less important in this uh, net, net accounting framework. So finally, just a, a couple of conclusions. Um, uh, so, so I've, I've put the, the figures I mentioned there, um, intangibles account for um, over 40% of the total capital remuneration in the UK, but when, when you use a net capital remuneration, net capital concept, then that goes down significantly, and also goes down for the US but less. Um, and uh, the contribution to growth of net intangible capital services is uh, uh, is much lower if if uh, if you use a net rather than if if you use a net rather than a gross approach. So um so I mean that's basically where we are on this. We we um kind of only very recently um put these numbers together. So again, you know, the numbers themselves um need to be taken with a, a pinch of salt. Nevertheless, they they you know they 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 illustrate the general point here. It's just that. If, you, if, you, if a lot of your investment is in um, assets that are really depreciate very rapidly, then um, it doesn't really have the same impact on well-being of people in the economy than if you're investing in, in, in assets that have uh, much, lower, uh, much lower depreciation rates. Okay, I'll leave it at that. I don't know what I'm doing for time. I wasn't really you know, just about right, I think. Thank you, Larry. Uh, thank you for being perfect on time and thanks for the great presentation. <laughs> Uh, so let me see if there are any questions. So currently there are no questions from the Q&A facility, um, but, uh, but, but please feel free to uh, submit your question if you uh, want to do so. Should I I'll, I'll stop sharing then I can see the questions myself. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And well, I do have some questions for you. Uh, so, um, so from your results, uh, is it correct that you're saying the gross investment, the, 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 the increasing trend in the gross investment in intangibles is mostly driven by the higher depreciation rather than like having an economic story behind it? Um, no, I don't think it's saying that it's, it's mostly driven by depreciation. It's mostly driven by assets that have very high depreciation rates. And therefore, I, um, if you you know if you if you um, want to know what's the contribution of capital to say a, a measure of economic well-being, um, you need to strip out that, that, that depreciation because a lot of the a lot, a lot of the activity is just keeping still. If you think of it that way, mm -hmm. and, you know you have to replace these assets, and uh, and therefore the, um, the the it's a it's a, it's a it's a different way of looking at the a, a concept of, of uh, contributions to output, which is much more in in tune with you know economic well-being than it is with uh, gross production. Okay, and are you able to see the industry breakdown for different types of investment from your data set? Because I'm just thinking uh, like if there's a shift in the investment by different sectors over time, uh, especially like is there a difference between intangibles and tangible uh, investment like in different sectors uh, over time. Yeah, so so we haven't done that yet. Um, but I, I, you know, again, while I was 
looking at the numbers and, and, and looking at the slides, I thought, yes, this is something that would be interesting mm -hmm. to look at. So we do know that um, if, we, if we look at, say, manufacturing versus services, manufacturing, a lot of the intangibles are in research and development. And research and development is not, is not a particularly rapidly depreciating intangible. Um, in, in the slides I showed, um, the, you know, the, the depreciation rate was about 15%, which was kind of comparable to, to uh, machinery and equipment. Um, and so um, I would expect there's different results there than in, in, if you look at the services sectors, these economic competencies where you've got very rapid depreciation rates and very, very high shares. And so you would get this cross industry uh, differences. And then that, I think when we, we, we were hoping to do a couple, add a couple more countries, um, France and Germany in particular. Now we, we, we're going to wait until the new consistent EU claims and 10 investors available because that should be available very shortly. But um, I think uh, in, in understanding these, these international differences, the composition, these compositions will be important, um, whether you have more manufacturing, more services, what type of services. So I think this would be certainly something that I would I'd want to go forward in this, in this work. Um, I'd like to bring Martin in. Martin, did you want to say anything? Could we could unmute Martin Wheel? Yeah. Well, because I don't think we have any other questions, do we? <laughs> Uh, not at the moment. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I suppose I wanted to say a bit more on why this sort of thing may matter. If, for example, you look at the share of labour in the product, you get a very different answer if you look at the share of labour in GDP from if you look at the share of labour in NDP. So depreciation does matter and not paying attention to it can distort the you know, picture we see of the economy or not paying, yes, not paying attention to depreciation can lead to possibly slightly you know, misleading judgments about what's going on in the economy. Uh, I mean, separately, of course, there was a very interesting article in Econometrica last year, which and you no, know, an article in Econometrica that I could understand quite straightforwardly, which showed that the increasing share of labour income in United States GDP was entirely a consequence of the capitalisation of the inclusion of intangibles and in particular research and development. So it certainly does matter. And I suppose what motivated me to take an interest in this was you no know, repeatedly seeing graphs well like the two that Mary presented at the start of the talk showing how intangibles were becoming much more important than tangibles for capital formation and I think actually you can only address that if you stop to think about what matters and uh, as Mary said is it really telling you very much about economic progress if you have capital goods which are used up very quickly and a lot of your output goes in simply replacing the capital goods that are used up in production? That's not something that can either support future incomes or go to support current consumption. So that's what lies behind the work. I suppose I was a bit surprised to find that in particularly in the United States that intangibles still you know, survived at about you know, on a net basis at about 30% of total capital formation. My prior had been that it would be lower than that but the point of empirical work is that you try and learn from it. I wasn't surprised by that, Martin. I think um, the US, you know, there has been a really big increase in, in, in intangible investment in, in the US relative to European countries. So um, mm -hmm. even if you strip out the depreciation, you're still going to get this, this bigger effect. But um, I, I, I do have to, again, emphasize that, you know, when, when we get the final figures, <laughs> will this still hold? I think it will, actually, because I think, you know, I don't, I, I think the, the intent and best figures are, are, are what are um, most reliable. It's tying in the EU claims. That's the, the issue at the moment. Okay. Well, I mean, I think it's fairly clear that we're going to go on getting this sort of thing because 
on a gross basis, I don't think anyone doubts the high share of intangibles and equally whatever depreciate wherever the depreciation rates do eventually settle down it seems to me highly likely that many of the intangibles depreciate faster than structures and machinery so i'm i'm pretty confident in the broad thrust of what we've been showing yeah mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, so the depreciation rates are directly obtained from the EU claims data, or is something that you uh, computed? Yeah, so it, it, I, we took those depreciation rates from the EU claims data, and they, they were calculated by me many, many years ago. <laughs> um, you, but, but using the um, very detailed asset by investment uh, matrices that you can, you, you can download from, you know, for, for the US, and uh, then they, they, um, we, we calculated these, these industry specific depreciation rates, which I think would be quite useful in this analysis if we go forward looking at the industry level. Um, however, I, I, I think some more work needs to be done on um, looking at how things have changed since that time period. And also to go to one, um, I mean, my, myself and Martin are having a debate here now, and this was <laughs> um, to Martin's point about um, you know, that in the, in the initial national accounts, they use net rather than gross. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the reasons for that is, is we know very little about depreciation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I, I did wonder if, suppose whoever was advocating for the net in 1941 had won out, would we now know more about depreciation because it would have been more important that we had this information? <laughs> because, you know, we really have very, very, very weak information anywhere in any country on this. I think somebody's asking a question here, actually. Uh, yes. Uh, so, yeah, so, so we have a question from Richard. Uh, Richard, would you want to ask the question yourself? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, I, I believe that, uh, I think it was uh, Josh Martin from the UNS has done some experimental work probably three years ago now, on splitting out intangible investments between capitalized and non-capitalized. Um, do you have any plans to, 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 to take that view in the work that you're doing? Um, I hadn't really thought about that, but I mean, I, I guess we were, we were just taking what was done in the Intan Invest, but um, you know, I, need, I need to look at what um, Josh is doing. I mean, we need to look, in some ways, we've just done this as a as a, as a fairly recent, fairly quick exercise. But um, I, I know there's more there's work being done at ONS also on on um, looking again at depreciation rates, asset lives. Maybe we need to 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 review that literature as well. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not I'm not 100 sure what I, I, I'm not familiar with that paper by Josh. So I don't know what he's uh, what he's capitalizing and what he's not capitalizing. I don't know whether you want to come back on that, Richard. Or, or there's a couple more questions here. I think I've, I've I've just shared the uh, uh, what I believe is the last paper, which includes the breakdown of um, by asset category, which is very similar to the categorization that you've used, uh, yeah. and it gives you the data on the capitalized non-capitalized splits. Yeah, okay, that's that. We'll, we, we'll certainly have a look at that. It's very useful. Thank you. Okay, cool. Yeah, and there's another comment by uh, Mel Lewis from ONS. Uh, so the comment is basically uh, we recently updated uh, the intangible estimates. Yeah, so um, Mel from ONS. Yeah, I was just wanted to um, come in. Thank you. And I say I've, I've kind of taken over this, this intangibles work now um, from Josh. Uh, so we had recently uh, published update estimates up to 2018. So those are available for anybody who'd like to, to, to use those. Yeah, I mean, maybe it would be um, good to have a look at uh, this kind of question using your estimates versus the Intan Invest as well. And, 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 and using the tangibles from ONS rather than from EU claims, and then, you know, looking at different depreciation rates. So I think, I think there's a lot we can do here. I think it's a, you know it's, it's it's an important topic. I mean, we we kind of concentrating on intangibles versus tangibles, but I mean you could also look at ICT versus the rest because you know in the in the tangible capital there is a rapidly depreciating asset which is computer hardware. Yeah, 
Um, so I think there's, um, there's, it's kind of a general question, not just tangibles versus intangibles, but also net versus gross, um, which we'd like to pursue. Okay, thank you, Mary. Uh, so we are out of time now. So <laughs> let's move yeah. to the next. Uh, yeah, so now I guess it's up to me to introduce Jackie. Um, so I'll, um, from the Bank of Canada. So, so Jackie, I'll let you go ahead and I'll, I'll just. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. So today I would like to present the paper on financial frictions and capital misallocation. Okay, many studies have found that capital misallocation can lower aggregate productivity. Intuitively, when capital is misallocated, some small productive firms may not be able to finance their optimal level of capital and have a high marginal product capital as a result. In this case, even if the aggregate quantity of capital is unchanged, reallocating capital from firms with lower MPK to firms with higher MPK can increase aggregate output and aggregate productivity. So given that capital misallocation can have this adverse impact on aggregate productivity, it is important to understand its causes. And financial frictions are often regarded as one contributing factor for capital misallocation, but its role is difficult to quantify. And this paper provides a novel method to quantify the impact of financially constrained firms on capital misallocation, which is measured by the dispersion of the marginal revenue product of capital. And I'll talk about this measure in, in the next slide. So after applying this method to large panels of manufacturing firms for 20 countries from the 1990s to 2015, I find that for most countries and industries, financially constrained firms have much higher dispersions and means of MRPK uh, or the marginal revenue product capital compared to unconstrained firms. So it is relatively obvious to think uh, that financially constrained firms would have higher uh, mean of MRPK because of a lower level of capital financed. So the MRPK tends to be higher, but uh, it's less obvious to see that the dispersion of MRPK for constrained firms are also higher. So this paper shows both theoretically and empirically that financially constrained firms do have this higher dispersion of MRPK compared to the unconstrained firms. And so after uh, using this empirical method to uh, identify the financially constrained firms, I find that more than a quarter of the firms can be classified as constrained using the manufacturing, uh, using data on manufacturing firms. And the presence of these constrained firms can account for more than half of the dispersion of uh, MRPK. In this slide, I will talk about how MRPK is calculated and why uh, capital misallocation can be measured by the dispersion of MRPK. Uh, I assume a firm produces by a Cobb Douglas production function. So it's MRPK is defined as the derivative of the firm's revenue with respect to its capital. And beta K is the revenue elasticity of capital. So because firm level prices are often unobserved in the data, it's very hard to calculate the MPK or marginal product of capital, but it's relatively easier to calculate the marginal revenue product of capital. In this paper, MRPK is measured by uh, nominal revenue over fixed tangible assets. So in a simple static model without any financial frictions or uh, capital adjustment costs, efficient allocation is when uh, all firms will be able to finance uh, their optimal level of capital. And uh, so, uh, so firms will be able to choose the optimal level of capital to equate uh, the MRPK to the interest rate. And assuming firms um, face the same interest rate, then the MRPK will also be the same across firms. And the dispersion of MRPK will be zero in this case. However, in reality, there are many reasons why uh, the static MRPK can be different across firms. And this includes the capital adjustment costs and financial constraints, as well as many other factors. So for example, with capital adjustment costs, even if capital is allocated efficiently ex ante, ex post MRPK can still be different across firms because of the different realizations of the firm productivity shocks. And with financial constraint, so 
financially constrained firms would not be able to finance their optimal level capital. So their MRPK would be higher. So the dispersion of MRPK across constrained and constrained firms would be positive. So intuitively in this case, capital is misallocated in the sense that uh, constrained firms capital demand is constrained by their balance sheet conditions and their capital demand is no longer driven by uh, their productivity. So this paper, uh, the theoretical model of this paper captures both of these uh, sources of uh, dispersion, but I'm not going to disentangle uh, the different causes for capital misallocation. Instead, I want to focus on uh, the financial constraint. And this paper uh, estimates uh, to what extent can uh, financially constrained firms explain the uh, observed dispersion of MRPK across firms. In this slide, I will talk about the method that I used to uh, quantify the proportion of the observed dispersion of MRPK that can be explained by the financially constrained firms. And the first step is to divide firms into financially constrained and unconstrained types using a switch and regression approach. And the second step is to uh, decompose the dispersion of MRPK into the cross-section variances uh, of MRPK for unconstrained firms and constrained firms, and uh, the cross-section means of MRPK for different groups of firms. So this decomposition is for a given time period. And SU is uh, the fraction of unconstrained firms. And SC is the uh, fraction of constrained firms. So you can see that the observed dispersion of MRPK can be written as a weighted uh, sum of the weighted average of these cross-section variances uh, plus uh, a measure of distance uh, between the means for each group. And based on this decomposition, I came up with this credit distortion measure, which ranges from uh, zero to one. So you can see that when all firms are unconstrained, when this fraction of unconstrained firms is one, then SC is zero. So these two terms would drop out and the observed dispersion is just equivalent to the dispersion among unconstrained firms. In this case, the credit distortion measure will be zero. It just implies that uh, all the observed dispersion of MRPK uh, is explained by the financially unconstrained firms. And because constrained firms tend to have higher MRPK due to a lower level of capital financed, uh, the mean of MRPK uh, within the constrained firms uh, tends to be higher than that for uh, unconstrained firm. And when this gap between the means for each group is smaller, then the credit distortion measure is also smaller. Okay, so this paper contributes to two strands of the literature. And uh, empirical finance literature has provided different ways of uh, classifying firms into financially constrained and unconstrained types. The simplest way is just to divide firms based on their age and size. And there are also papers using this index-based approach, which is to estimate uh, the probabilities of the firms being constrained based on some accounting ratios. And more recently, there are also papers using this switch, switch and regression approach, which is related to the index-based approach in terms of estimating uh, the probabilities of the firms being constrained, but it also uses some extra information from firms' uh, investment behavior. This paper also adopts this switch and regression approach. And instead of focusing on the US listed firms as in most of the existing literature, uh, this paper looks at uh, uh, both the listed and unlisted firms, which is important for studying financial constraint because small unlisted firms tend to, are more likely to suffer from financial constraints. And existing macro literature on capital misallocation tends to rely on structural models. So the impact of financial frictions is implied by either the estimated parameters or the quantitative predictions from the model. So this paper provides a new empirical method to uh, estimate the impact of the financially constrained firms uh, on capital misallocation measured by this dispersion of MRPK. 
and this method relies on fewer restrictive assumptions. So I'll briefly talk about the theoretical framework, uh, the switching regression model, which is based on this theoretical framework. And then I'll talk about the data, some empirical results, and finally I will conclude. Okay, so I assume firms engage in monopolistic competition and give them manufacturing industries. So they produce uh, a differentiated product using labor materials and pre-installed capital via Cobb Douglas production function. So PY is the firm's uh, revenue. And capital is financed by firms' net worth and borrowing. And firms face a financial friction, which is modeled by uh, the costly debt enforcement problem. Uh, this implies that firms cannot be forced to repay unsecured debt. So they will face a collateral constraint. And their borrowing would, be, uh, would need to be smaller than a fraction of the undepreciated capital. And this can be equivalently written in terms of capital and net worth. So you can see capital, uh, constraint firms capital is constrained by their amount of net worth. So the key prediction from the model is that the net investment will be different uh, for unconstrained and constrained firms. So for unconstrained firms, their investment would depend on expected sales growth. While for constrained firms, their investment would be very sensitive to cash flow. And so cash flow is uh, the sum of net income and the depreciated capital, where net income is basically this uh, change in net worth. Okay, so in this slide, I will talk about how I classify firms into different types using the switching regression model. Uh, so this switching regression model is based on the theoretical result that firms' uh, net investment will be different for constrained and unconstrained firms. So S star here is the latent variable which determines uh, firms' constraint status. And X, uh, the vector of variables uh, in X include the lacked sales growth and lacked uh, cash flow. And X S, so although like X uh, contains the same variables, but gamma will be different because according to the theoretical prediction, constraint firms uh, investment will be more sensitive to uh, cash flow. So the parameters gamma will be different across different investment uh, regimes. And XS includes uh, the variables that can affect uh, the firm's uh, financial constraint status. So this switch regression itself uh, doesn't really identify which investment regime is constrained. Uh, so identification would require some theoretical priors. I find, uh, so I use the priors that younger, smaller firms with higher MRPK would be more likely to be constrained. So basically I use the size of, uh, the, the size of age, size and MRPK to identify which investments regime is constrained. And I didn't use the leverage or liquidity ratios to identify uh, the constraint regime because ex ante is not really clear uh, how these two would affect the firm's uh, constraint status. And once the investment regime is classified as constrained, uh, the, a firm is classified as a constrained firm if the probability of being in the investment, constrained investment regime is greater than 0.5. Okay, so this paper focuses on the manufacturing sector in 20 countries. So because capital stock is well defined in the manufacturing sector and it is measured by the fixed tangible assets. And I use, I use obvious firm level data uh, for listed and unlisted firms. So unlisted firms are more likely to suffer from uh, financial constraints. You can see from this table here uh, for the median number of employees and median age within the unlisted firms and listed firms. By comparing the two, you can see listed firms uh, tend to have much higher uh, number of employees and they tend to be uh, older uh, than the unlisted firms. Okay, so for the empirical results, I will focus on two parts. So this presentation will just show uh, the results for one specific two-digit uh, manufacturing industry, which is the, the fabricated metal products industry. I'll first show the estimated uh, parameters from the switching regression model, which includes a selection equation and investment regimes. So the purpose of doing so is just to show that um, the results from this switching regression model are consistent with uh, a theoretical uh, hypothesis. Uh, 
And um, so after uh, estimating this regression regression model, I used the results to classify firms uh, into constrained and unconstrained types. And I calculate, uh, and then I can calculate the proportion of uh, the dispersion of MRPK that can be explained by the presence of constrained firms. So this, uh, which is basically summarized by this credit distortion measures, you can see once I know the fraction of unconstrained firms and the dispersion uh, of MRPK within the unconstrained firms, then I can calculate this um, credit distortion measure. Okay, so this slide shows the, some um, key variables in the selection equation. And I didn't include the liquidity and leverage ratios here uh, for simplicity, but uh, they are included in the selection equation as well. So this table shows that age, size measured by the log of assets and MRPK are jointly correct, uh, have jo like are jointly have these correct signs. Uh, uh, which are consistent with expectations that uh, firms that uh, uh, younger, smaller firms with higher MRPK uh, are more likely to be constrained. So the sign for age and assets are uh, negative, and at the same time, the sign for MRPK is positive. So uh, the signs are jointly correct. And in this slide, I want to show that uh, constrained firms investment uh, is more sensitive to cash flow. So you can see the coefficients in this column for cash flow under the constraint regime uh, tend to be significantly positive and much larger than the coefficients of on cash flow under the unconstrained investments regime. So this slide shows uh, the proportion of constrained firms uh, for different um, samples of firms. So this is calculated using the uh, results from the switch and regression model after I classify firms into different types. Then I want to see uh, what is the proportion uh, of the constrained firms that are identified empirically. So I look at three different samples. The first is uh, the whole sample all firms. And then I look at the subsample of unlisted firms and the subsample of listed firms. So the purpose of showing the listed firms is just to say that uh, since large listed firms are uh, less likely to be financially constrained, the identified constrained firms within this subsample of listed firms should be much lower. And this can serve as a validation of the empirical results. So if you look at the purple or red bar here, uh, they are the proportions of constrained firms for all firms and for unlisted firms. So uh, you can see this um, proportion is greater than 0.25 in most countries, which means that more than 25% of firms uh, can be classified as constrained in most countries. And consistent with the expectation, uh, this proportion of co constrained firms within this subsample of listed firms is indeed uh, much lower. So this slide shows the dispersion of MRPK uh, for constrained firms and unconstrained firms. So uh, ex ante is not really clear how the dispersion of MRPK for constrained firms will compare with unconstrained firms. But based on the theoretical model in this paper, I show that uh, even theoretically, the dispersion of MRPK for constrained firms would be higher. This is because the dispersion for uh, constrained firms is driven by um, the dispersion of uh, productivity innovation as for unconstrained firms. But on top of that, it's also driven by the firm heterogeneity um, among these constrained firms in terms of their productivity and net worth. So uh, the empirical results are consistent with the theoretical results uh, that this dispersion, uh, the constraint firms do have like higher uh, dispersion of MRPK compared to unconstrained firms. So in this slide, I show the credit distortion measure for uh, uh, different samples of firms, for all firms, unlisted firms, and listed firms. So uh, you can see from the first two bars, the 
credit distortion measure is uh, above 0.5 in most countries, which implies that the presence of constrained firms can explain more than 50% of the observed dispersion of MRPK in most countries. And if you look at the third bar, which is the credit distortion for listed firms, uh, it is um, lower uh, in many countries, except for Sweden, uh, which is probably because um, of the low number of observations uh, in this case. And so this credit distortion in listed firms uh, being lower uh, compared to the other samples. Uh, so this fact can serve as a validation of this credit distortion measure because this is consistent with the expectation that uh, the listed firms uh, should be, uh, large listed firms are less likely to suffer from uh, financial constraints. Okay, so I'll skip the robustness checks and I'll conclude by saying that this paper uh, provides a novel method to quantify uh, the impact of financially constrained firms on capital misallocation, which is measured by uh, the dispersion of MRPK. And after applying this method to large panels and manufacturing firms for 20 countries, I find that for most countries and two-digit industries, financially constrained firms would have uh, much higher dispersions of means of MRPK uh, compared to unconstrained firms. And more than a quarter of these firms can be classified as constrained. The presence of these constrained firms can account for uh, more than half of the dispersion of MRPK. Okay, thank you, and that's the end of the presentation. Thank you, Jackie. Um, there is a question. Yeah, and it was it was kind of the same question I was going to ask, but I'll ask Martin to ask it instead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, thank you very much. This was a very interesting paper. Now, when I was working at the Bank of England, we used to hear quite a lot about the argument that capital was misallocated and that had adverse effects for productivity. But as far as I could see, it probably didn't have very big adverse effects for productivity. So how much would you expect productivity to go up in a representative country that you looked at if the unconstrained, if the constrained firms turned into unconstrained firms? That's a great question. So that's something that I haven't really done in this paper so far. Uh, so I'm basically taking for granted that capital misallocation would uh, lower aggregate productivity. And then I'm focusing on the causes of capital misallocation. So I think, uh, so there's this, uh, empirical evidence in the literature that, uh, that finds that um, uh, capital misallocation can uh, lower aggregate productivity. So I'm basically uh, using the evidence from the literature um, as a motivation. But I mean, I could uh, look into this and see how this, um, uh, how uh, the results in this paper would translate into um, uh, the impact on uh, aggregate productivity, but that's the uh, that's something that I haven't really done so far. But thank you, that's a great question. I mean, yes, I so suppose, I, yeah, on, Martin, go ahead. Go I mean, I suppose my other thought on that is <laughs> that, as you say, the returns are higher for the constrained firms. Most capital investment takes place out of retained profits, so you wouldn't expect capital starvation to last for very long. At least that again was an argument that I always used to bring out at the Bank of England and you know, never was quite dissuaded of it. Yes, that, um, that's actually also one of the arguments in a theoretical paper by Mitrick and Xu, I think. So they also, they're saying that uh, capital misallocation, the financial frictions, uh, it, it could be like the impacts of financial frictions could be undermined by this accumulation of uh, net worth. So that is probably not very important for to explain uh, capital misallocation. So basically the literature has produced a mixed results on how uh, the importance of financial frictions in explaining uh, the capital misallocation. So there are papers that say uh, financial frictions can be very important uh, for explaining uh, financial, uh, for explaining capital misallocation, but there are also 
uh, papers saying uh, financial frictions probably don't really matter that much. So these papers differ in their data sets used and also uh, their model assumptions. And so in a paper using uh, the US data, they tend to find that financial frictions um, don't really matter for capital misallocation, but uh, there are also papers using uh, the Spanish manufacturing data, for example, and uh, the Gopinath paper in 2017. Uh, they find that the size dependent um, borrowing constraints can explain uh, the large increase in the dispersion of MRPK over time in, uh, uh, in Spain during 1999 to uh, 2007. So basically the results are uh, mixed and I guess it depends on um, uh, which countries you're lo looking at and also like how you think about uh, the model mechanisms and the mechanisms that you're saying uh, is definitely um, uh, one channel and also there could be uh, other uh, offsetting effects, I think. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, going on from that, if I understand correctly, um, a lot of the um, financially constrained firms are, 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 are young firms. Mm -hmm. And young firms are startups and young firms, at least some of them become older, more mature, and, and uh, I think there's a literature that suggests over time there's, um, that has been important for um, driving productivity. So if there is capital misallocation due to that, does it really matter? I mean, you know, in some ways it's a, it's, it's a cost you have to bear uh, in order to get to a, to, to a long run, a better place, I suppose. So, I don't know if that's, is, is that correct interpretation? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, okay, that's also something related to, so young firms tend to be, they, they, they can be more productive, and, but because they're also young and they probably don't have enough networks to finance their optimal level of capital, so in this case, the ideal case is just to say, uh, we should lend to these productive firms, but then, uh, but, but, but then it's probably also more risky. And so I think that comes to the question of uh, what we could do to reduce uh, these financial constraints faced by uh, the small firms. And so that's something that I need to think more carefully about. And yeah, but that's a good question. And that comes down to uh, what can be done to alleviate uh, this uh, financial constraint problem that, uh, that can be uh, more important for these uh, small um, young firms. Are there any other questions in the audience? I mean, I, I seem to have a recollection that um, there was a paper by Jonathan Haskell and co-authors who mm -hmm. looked at capital misallocation. And, and I, I thought Martin, they found quite big effects, but I, I mean, my, my memory could be wrong on this. Um, it, it was a very different type of analysis. I think it was kind of. A, a I must say, I don't level. know that paper, so I'm afraid I can't comment on it. <laughs> yeah, and I haven't seen it in print. I mean, it was a paper that was done. It was pre presented at a project I was involved in some years ago. You can look it up. Yeah, you can Google it and look it up. Yeah. yeah. OK, great. Thank you. So I don't think there's anything else, um, unless you want to say a few more words. Okay, so let me stop sharing. Yeah. And okay, so we don't have any more questions coming in. So probably I'll just conclude this session. Uh, yeah. So I'll conclude our session by thanking all the uh, presenters and participants to this session. And if you have any further questions, please feel free to email the presenters via email. And uh, yeah, thank you all for your participation and uh, have a nice day. <laughs>